um, kind of working through, right? And so, um, uh, you know, working through this kind of progression through the Psalms. And as I was getting ready for today, um, it, it got me thinking about um, movies um, and those, some of those pivotal scenes in movies. For example, if you've ever seen Princess Bride, um, you know, the dread pirate is climbing up the hill and at the top, or up the cliff, and at the top of the cliff, there's the Spaniard, Ingo. He's, like, standing there looking over, and, you know, he's like, could you hurry up? He's, like, waiting for him to come up the, the cliff, and he's like, you know, I'm in, I'm in a little bit of a rush. Could you, can you, and he's like, and then the guy climbing up, the pirate is like, well, you could throw me a rope, and then he, the Spaniard replied, well, I wasn't sure how you'd feel about that, since when you get to the top of the cliff, I'm going to kill you. And then the pirate's like, well, that does put a damper on the situation in our relationship. Um, you know, and there's all these moments in movies like that, right? Give me the briefcase. Well, I don't know. Am I going to trust you and hand you the briefcase, right? Or, you know, grab my hand as I, as I have here. Um, Yes, it is on. Hit the button there. <clears throat> One more. Right? There's that. You're hanging on the cliff, right? And it's like, you know, give me your hand, give me your hand. It's like, well, do I trust this person? You know, in the case of the Princess Bride, uh, you know, he threw the rope over, and um, they trusted one another to the, f <laughs> to the point where, you know, the one guy hands his sword to the other one and, like, admiring each other's swords before they then have their duel. Other movies, you know, it doesn't go uh, so well, right? You know, Darth Vader said, Luke, trust me, you know, come join me. And Luke's like, yeah, I don't think so. And he chops his hand off, <clears throat> right? So there's these moments in movies. I'd like to suggest what we've been working through is kind of moving in the same direction. Uh, you know, a few weeks ago, I talked about um, in Psalm 62, 62, the way David um, is looking to God and trusting in God to be his rock, to be his salvation, right? To, to walk with him through the trials that he's experiencing. Last week, Kyle talked about, you know, when we do this, when we grab a hold of that hand of God, there are benefits, right? In Psalm 37, it talks about you know, the righteous and the benefits of being the righteous um, as opposed to those who choose not to, or as the psalmist calls them in that psalm, the, the wicked. Um, and what I, I think we're kind of on this journey, though, where God is now asking us, are you going to grab my hand? Are you going to trust me? Today, though, I'd like to put a, a little bit of a spin on it. Um, and say that that grabbing of the hand comes with some responsibilities and expectations. And so um, what I'd like to, to suggest is that, you know, just as God shows himself and has shown himself, and we saw it in the Psalms and we see it in our own lives, shows himself to be trustworthy to us, right, as our loving Father, he is also trusting us to be the faithful, to be faithful to our calling as his children, right? So this is, as I um, kind of titled the sermon, this, this relationship of trust cuts both ways, right? And so there's a responsibility on our part. I'd like to um, kind of open this up by looking at um, Micah chapter 6. Since I'm having trouble with this. Excuse me. So, oh, I want to. So, let me just read this while Caesar sees if he can fix this. So, I'm going to read the first eight verses of Micah chapter 6. While I read this, I want you to observe um, the reciprocal nature of trust um, and that this idea of that it's cutting both ways and, and see how Micah is playing this out. 
Listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up and state your case against me. Let the mountains and hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O oh mountains, listen to the Lord's complaint. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against Israel. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me, for I brought you out of Egypt. I redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed? And how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness. What can we bring to the Lord, then? What kind of offering should we give him? Should we bow down before God with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and ten thousands river of oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So in this passage, um, Micah is kind of playing out um, and, and setting up, showing us this kind of reciprocal nature of the trust relationship between God and his people. So you can see, right, Micah <clears throat> um, recalls, recollects how God has been trustworthy to the nation of Israel, bringing them out of um, Egypt and then caring for them, even to the point where, you know, one person's trying to curse them and he's turning the tables and instead they're being um, blessed. As you remember, when I introduced the idea of trust um, two weeks ago, I talked about um, you know, how can we kind of sense trust or how, what, what are some of the factors? And there's that idea of somebody's ability and their integrity and their benevolence. Um, and we see those factors at play here, right? Great stuff. Um, but at the end, in verse 8, what does Micah do, right? He tells us, tells the Israelites, um, you know, what I'm looking for here is... Um, what God is looking for is not just making sacrifices, right? He's looking for um, their hearts. And I want to unpack that a little bit more. I want to look at two different things that I um, think can help us kind of work through this and, and, and either evaluate our own lives or set up some, some ideas about how we can start to fulfill this second um, um, our side of the, the trust relationship. Is it working, Caesar? Thank you. So maybe I'm just not operating this right. Okay. I'm not operating it right. <clears throat> so one of my typical um, uh, comments to students when I, it's like, oh, we have to do this, or here's this new piece of software, and I typically will say, look, this is so easy, even a professor can do it. <clears throat> Clearly, <clears throat> this is not so easy that even a professor can do it, so... So two things I want to draw our attention to. One is the expectations here. And how can we start thinking about um, this sense of expectation and, and God's expectations for us? <clears throat> and then the other is this idea of execution. So um, if we kind of buy into this idea that God has expectations of us, okay, how are we going to pull this off? How are we going to execute this um, and make it happen? Hopefully... It'll be a little bit more simple than the typical Rube Goldberg plan for how to do something. This is a machine that uh, allows you to, um, you know, use a napkin. Um, if you've ever seen any Rube Goldberg designs, they're absolutely um, brilliant. If you're a little bit older, you ever played Mousetrap growing up, um, that's an example of a Rube Goldberg um, design. So how are we going to execute this? 
So I recognize, um, right, this can be daunting um, and a bit overwhelming. So let's kind of um, unpack this a little bit more. So what is God expecting? Let's go back and look at verse 8, right? <clears throat> he has shown you, O mortal, O person, O peoples, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? And, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's not, um, you know, rocket science here. To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Um, what's interesting in the, in the um, Hebrew, you know, he's shown you what is good. This isn't like, oh, that was a good meal, or, you know, that was a nice, good movie. But this idea of good is, is uh, you know, much richer than that in, in the way um, Mike is using it. Right? This is about moral, ethical rightness, kind of this deep sense of this is good, right? What I'm doing here is right and ethical and moral. And that's what God is looking for, right? Is that, that deep and rich sense of um, what we are doing and we're really thinking about it. <clears throat> the other um, word that I thought was really interesting, you know, what does the, the, the Lord require of you? And the one, the, the phrase of to love mercy Mercy um, is the Hebrew word chesed, um, which is a really, really important word throughout the um, whole Old Testament. Um, it's the word that God first used to describe himself on Mount Sinai to Moses. And so when, he, when Moses says to him, show me who you are, one of the first words God uses is, I am a God of hesed. I'm a God of loving kindness, of mercy that goes from generation to generation, right? And so that's, again, that's the spirit of what um, God is expecting of us. <clears throat> so um, obviously this can be a bit overwhelming, a bit daunting. And so what do we do about this? You know, and I think going back and thinking about even Psalm 62, and we all might have different things that we do. But Psalm 62, for me, is a great um, starting point, right, of reminding ourselves, as David did, starting the process of thinking about these things, who is God, right? And so it's not starting with our shortcomings or our, our sense of inequ inequity, uh, inability, but starting with who God is and what he's able to do. And then certainly, as Kyle was trying to, you know, unpacking last week, you know, what are the benefits here? So are we setting ourselves up um, in the right, um, kind of right perspective? You know, and, and I, I certainly can relate to this when, um, and, and it's always, you know, kind of that looking back, but, you know, even as I was um, preparing this, it caused me to start to look back and, and start to see, you know, here are these different moments um, where God has been faithful, um, even when I wasn't necessarily expecting or looking for it. But there are certainly very specific ones. When I started my graduate degree, um, Mary, Mary Beth and I, you know, the plan was, well, she was this kind of corporate weenie in her suit going to work, and so she would pay for, you know, the expenses while I got my master's degree. Well, wouldn't you know it, I don't know, a month, two months into me starting, she was laid off, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, now what's going to happen here, right? But God was faithful in providing, and even the severance that her company gave her that we thought, okay, this is how we'll, you know, pay our, our rent and, and things until you can find a job. We never even touched that severance until, I think, three years later or so when God provided a condominium for us because the apartment we were living in uh, we started to have that sense, this apartment is going to be sold, the building, and we should probably get moving. And, and so the money that we thought was going to pay for one thing ended up helping pay for um, a down payment on our condominium. So it's like all these things. And I still remember when I was finishing up my, my um, doctoral program, and um, there were, I was in this weird kind of limbo as far as... Um, you know, a job for the next year in the college where I was like, well, we can't promise you anything yet. You need to wait. A flyer, like literally a piece of paper in the mail shows up for the job posting at Geneseo. I didn't even know Geneseo existed <laughs> at the time. 
<laughs> had never heard of it, and this flyer shows up. And when you know, I mean, we had been starting to talk about, well, should we move back to western New York where our families are? And here this, this job possibility just pops up. So there's all these little moments, right, where God has shown himself to be trustworthy um, and to be faithful. And so how are we looking at those things um, so that that expectation that God is now working on us of, can I trust you to be the child that um, I'm calling you to be? It's easier to make that decision to love mercy, to um, act justly, to walk humbly with God, because I can see how he's been working in my own life. <clears throat> and so even as I had suggested, you know, it's like, what am I doing in my own life, right? Um, you know, I, I printed out my little paraphrase of the first two verses of Psalm 62, and I taped it on my desk at work. Um, so when I get to work on tomorrow or Tuesday or whenever I show up on campus next, you know, before I drop my laptop down on the desk, the first thing I'm going to see is, um, are these words, truly my soul, my very being, all that I am, finds rest in God. My salvation, any assurance of deliverance or victory this day comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. So, you know, my hope is that's how I'm going to start my, my work day now um, so that I can um, have that sense. Um, so my goal today, even as we kind of set this sense of expectation up, is not for us to feel overwhelmed. Um, it's not for us to feel um, burdened, but it's really for us um, to feel encouraged um, to then kind of move into, so what am I going to do in my life? So my, my goal for us this morning is by the end, you know, you'll start to have some ideas of how I might be um, making possible changes, which leads us to this second chunk of this kind of executing a plan. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. So for me, there's two things going on here. One would be our attitude, and, and kind of um, what I've just been talking about, hopefully, is shaping our attitude. How are we going to approach this um, idea of uh, the expectations of God? Um, you know, and certainly, um, you know, can go even further. We're not alone in this, right? Um, it made me think of Hebrews 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip, strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance, the race of God set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. Right, so we've got these folks around us cheering us on, right? We've got our model in Jesus. He's not asking us um, to endure the same cross that he did, um, but he's set this example, right? Or Paul in Philippians. <clears throat> Hold firmly to the word of life then on the day of Christ's return. I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless, but I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. So, you know, Paul is calling us to say, um, you know, join me in, in this offering of here I am, God, what can I do? Um, and so it's, you know, making this daily decision of um, choosing um, to follow Jesus to to, you know, walk in the same path um, and to, to do what he's, um, God is asking us to do. So, you know, if we're on board with that idea, right, there's still questions, right? Well, I don't know what to do, right? Well, I'm ready to serve God. I'm ready to walk um, humbly with God, to, to, you know, act justly, to find mercy. I don't know what God's will. There's, this is a good idea hear this quite a lot on campus. I don't know what God's will is for my life if, when I have students in my office. There are too many needs. I'm feeling overwhelmed. I don't have any skills that seem to be needed. So what are we going to do? Right? So how do we, um, 
uh, uh, take some action steps. So here are some few things to, to consider. Certainly, I want to go to the end of verse 8, which is this idea of walking humbly with your God, right? And I've already been kind of unpacking that. You know, this has to be our starting point um, because this isn't something that we're trying to do or can do successfully um, in our own strength. So first we start with God and, um, and go to him and, and be honest with him. Um, go back and read Psalm 62 or your favorite psalm of encouragement um, uh, and, and see what, um, what you can draw from that for your own strength. But second, as, it's, as the, the um, verse 8 in Micah says, it's not just spending time with God, right? It's doing the right thing, um, right? So it's going out to and finding that neighbor. As I was, um, you know, working on this, it made me think of uh, Pharisees or Sadducees. I don't remember whom. Um, one of them, right, is trying to trick Jesus, trying to get him to, to, to say the wrong thing, you know. And so what's the greatest commandment, right? This verse really reflects Jesus' response, right? The greatest commandment, love your God. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, right? Walk humbly with your God. Um, you know, do mercy, um, act justly, you know, and we're doing that with our, our neighbors. That can mean a lot of things. And, you know, the 7,500 people that are sitting here, this is going to be going to potentially play out for all of us um, a little bit um, differently. So I want to point us back to, um, as maybe a helpful starting point, those pillars of trust that I referenced um, a couple of weeks ago, right? And, and those, there was three of them. And, and so my suggestion here is, if we're trying to work through these and kind of act these out in our life um, in relationship with what we are feeling is, is um, what we're, we should be doing within the church, God is going to find us trustworthy, right? And that's that reciprocal nature. We'll be grabbing onto his hand, and he'll be grabbing onto ours. So those pillars, again, one was ability, right? Can we do the thing we need to do? You know, and that raises the question of um, what should you be doing, right? And so how do we figure that out? And, you know, there's, um, I remember once being in a small group, and we, there was somebody in our group who um, needed a job, and you know, his solution, he wanted, he was trying to be very spiritual, and maybe you can tell from my tone already that I didn't agree with his method, um, but his solution was, well, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to, in those days, we still look for jobs in the newspaper, and I'm going to open the newspaper, and God is going to reveal to me in the newspaper the job that I should apply for. Um, I, I don't think that's the way God works um, in most cases. He can. I'm not saying he can't. Um, but I think it, it, there's more we should be and can be doing relative to what are our abilities, what are our skills, and we start talking to people, right? So there's a lot of things we can do to try to start to think this through. Um, you know, who do we go and talk to? There's people who know us, right? And, and they can start to give us ideas. This is what I see you doing. This is how I see you equipped. This is how I see you are gifted. This is what I see you doing that gets you, seems to get you really excited. Certainly there's, there is praying and, and going through scriptures that are going to encourage us. Um, and we know, right, that, that all of scripture is going to help us. But, you know, what are those verses that might be encouraging and helping us? But, you know, also engaging in our own self-reflection. What do I enjoy doing? What brings me a sense of joy? Um, even to the point, um, you know, as I work with students on campus, of creating mission statements. Um, years ago, more than maybe 25 years ago or so, um, I had a, 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 an interesting moment in my life. I went on a women's retreat which was a really interesting time. Um, so I was invited to a women's retreat. And I was like, okay, I'll go. Um, I was really going to run the sound system 
There was also a nefarious plan on the planner of the retreat um, because Mary Beth and I were married at the time and they had a sense that Mary Beth wouldn't go alone. So it's like, well, if we invite Andrew to run the sound, then she'll come along. But it was a really fascinating retreat and I actually learned from it um, as I sat in the back corner. Um, and this was a, a retreat for um, a room full of mostly overachieving, um, hardworking, um, super dedicated, um, responsible women. You know, moms who were trying to take care of the three kids and get them here and there while also having this job and doing this and volunteering here. And, and the whole idea of the retreat was developing a mission statement um, because then if you've developed a mission statement kind of in the quiet of a few days or a few weeks of thinking mission statements both guide you but they can also give you the chance to say no to things so if I've developed a mission statement that is about um, you know working with college kids and I'm asked to teach the Sunday school downstairs for the five-year-olds I can say it's important but it's not part of my mission and so sorry but I can't um, and I can say that without feeling guilty because, um, because I've done the work of thinking about where my abilities are and where my strengths are and what I feel like God has, has equipped me to do. Um, that doesn't mean I don't try to help down there by finding somebody else or making suggestions, but I don't have to feel guilty. So do we start to develop that sense of how do we describe ourselves, our strengths, our abilities, um, our desires? And then when all else fails, um, you just do something, right? This was a great book. Benjamin was given this book, uh, my son, when he graduated um, from college just now. The, the, his home church back in Chicago um, gave him this book as a little um, gift. I love the little subtitle. So, you know, the book title, as you can see, is Just Do Something. Or, here's the subtitle. How to make a decision without dreams, vision, fleeces, impressions, open doors, random Bible verses, casting lots, liver shivers, writing in the sky, etc. Right? And so, you know, the, the impetus of this book is just get moving. Do something and start to see how God is working through that. So, um, so the first idea here as far as our, kind of our executing this is... Um, finding something that I can do that lines up with my abilities. The second thing is this idea of integrity, right? And, you know, how do I kind of walk the walk and walk the talk and that kind of idea, right? So what am I going to implement into my life? So if I'm making decisions, am I taking the necessary steps to, to make sure it's going to happen? Have I told somebody, yeah, you know, I think this year I feel like I should be working with the kids, and then that's going to start the ball rolling. Um, do I set up, if it's something that isn't quite as public, do I set up an accountability partner, right? You know, I have committed to, I feel like um, I'm um, being called to, to, you know, have a, a, a much more purposeful prayer ministry. Well, you know, if I'm just deciding to do that each and every day, it may or it may not happen. But, you know, if I've told this to Dan and said, Dan, I want you to text me every night at 8 o'clock and say, so, how did your prayer go, praying go today, right? I'm more likely now to kind of follow through that and have a, a much sen better sense of integrity in the process. So, uh, you know, what steps are we taking um, to make sure that our actions, our decisions are having this sense of integrity? The last category um, of this pillar of trust was this idea of benevolence, um, which is that, uh, that sense of caring, of looking out for the well-being of others. Um, you know, and certainly if you're like, I, I don't know what to do still. I don't, wouldn't know where to start. You're never going to go wrong starting with benevolence, right? And even um, as Micah was, you know, clearly said, right, act justly, love mercy, so, you know, find out how or find where you can do that. Um, as, as Paul says in Philippians, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of, other, thinking of others is better than yourselves. 
Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. So, you know, let's think creatively, let's think broadly, let's think graciously, um, and, and see, you know, where are their needs out there? Um, Mary Beth and I and Benjamin were in Connecticut visiting her family last weekend, and um, uh, they, they had a piece of paper that they handed out of different ministries and things. And, you know, and they're doing some interesting things at that church. Um, actually, some of it came from conversations that I had had with Mary Beth's sister, Becky, last Christmas. And so now, once a month, they um, set up a, a, a table with food and things for the, um, one of the um, schools that are nearby. So the teachers can come in and get some fun food um, once a month. They, they set up and bring food um, into the police station once a month or every couple of months. So they're trying to find ways um, to show care and well-being for others, right? Some of them can be more public, others can be more private, but how can we show benevolence towards others? So, you know, thinking through these can start to guide us or help us to either evaluate what we are doing or guide us in thinking about what we might start to do. So I will repeat um, what I said um, last time. Um, this isn't easy, right? Even as I was preparing this, um, you know, there was those moments where I was like, oh, I should and I could and why haven't I? And, um, and so I want to encourage us to not go down that path, right? To, to, um, to recognize, um, you know, that this, this reciprocal relationship of... Um, you know, recognizing how God has shown himself to be trustworthy and how he is looking to us to be trustworthy as well in our um, uh, role as his children. Um, it's, it's a journey, right? It's a, it's a struggle at times. There's ups and there's downs. Um, but, you know, yay, God is, God is nice. God is gracious, right? He's forgiving, um, he's patient, as we all know. And so, you know, we don't have to, you know, at times like, oh, this makes me anxious, this makes me nervous. And, you know, ultimately that's not the right response, right? The right response is, okay, God, um, you know, I need help here. And I'm thinking about this, and what do you think? And, um, and so it's, you know, recognizing um, that God isn't going to let go of our hand if we haven't done a good job. Um, right? He's, he's not going to chop off our hand because we didn't do the right thing. Um, but instead, really, you know, this next passage um, I find really encouraging, right? And this is in Matthew, uh, you know, as, as um, um, we're coming before Christ. And then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger. You invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. I'm pretty confident um, that this list is not um, the only options. <laughs> right? So, you know, if you show up, it's like, well, I had a prayer ministry. Didn't you read the memo? <laughs> Didn't you read Matthew 25? I checked, prayer wasn't on here, so sorry. No, right? Matthew is giving us the spirit of what God is looking for here, right? <clears throat> Are you ex exhibiting an attitude of benevolence? Are you exhibiting an attitude of walking humbly with God, of acting justly, of loving mercy, of loving, pursuing um, loving kindness with our neighbors? Right? That's what God is looking for us to do. And so that's the challenge that I've been challenging myself with um, as I've been working through um, uh, both preparing for today and even starting back um, when I first started thinking about this idea of trusting God. And so that's the challenge I'm, I'm laying out for all of us. I want to give us, um, like I did two weeks ago, a little bit of space um, to think about this a little bit more. And so what we're going to do is um, 
Um, Caesar's going to play a little rockabilly country. No, he'll play. A li he's going to just play just some soft music. So um, uh, we just have a little bit of room noise for. Um, we'll do this for about four or five minutes. Um, oh wait. Uh, oh, Caesar, give me one. Can we leave the slides up too? So, what is, you know, what was my takeaway here? So for me, in the, and the implication here is what, are go what is going to be your takeaway? Um, so for me, as I've been studying this, um, some thoughts that have really hit me is just as I'm trusting God to be who um, to be who he says he is and do what he says he'll do. Um, I think it's important for me to recognize he's trusting me <laughs> likewise, right? To be the child um, of God that I claim to be. And so that comes with those expectations. But I'm not alone in this endeavor, right? We've got this cloud of witnesses around us. We've got one another, right? Some of them we can see, some of them we can't. Um, the word of God is available to us and the Holy Spirit to help us. Um, I'm thankful even for the opportunities that he's already provided and for the opportunities that um, are coming in the future. So what about your takeaways? Right, so how does Micah 6? How does um, Matthew 25 and, um, uh, you know, you fed me, you clothed me, you visited me in prison. How do these passages encourage you um, how can you uh, praise God for the times you have had opportunities to walk humbly, to show mercy, to act justly? Um, and what does this um, mean in your own life right now? So what we'll do is give you some time. You can, these are just some prompts for you to think. Um, we'll have, a, like I said, four or five minutes um, for you to just meditate, um, write some notes to yourself if you wish. Um, and then I'll close us in prayer, and when I do that, then the, the worship team can come on up.
Father, I thank you that you are faithful. We see repeatedly and consistently examples of your trustworthiness throughout the Bible. Certainly, um, ultimately and, and, and definitively ex displayed on the cross. And we rest in that and we take um, hope in that and encouragement. And um, from that, we um, strive to devote ourselves um, in, in response to be found trustworthy by you in our decisions, in the way we choose to live our lives as your children and as your ambassadors, um, as, as family members, as neighbors, as community members, as workers and students, wherever we are, Lord. Um, help us to walk humbly with you. Help us to act justly. Help us to love, to love loving kindness and that that would be a mark of who we are as people. And as um, Peter says, as we live that kind of life, um, people will see and they will praise our Father in heaven. And so that is our prayer, Lord, that um, you would find us faithful in doing it, you would encourage us, you would help us so that um, at the end of the day, you um, are given the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.